Um, as Steffi indicated, I grew up on a small farm. And uh, this was in the middle of the Alps. Some of you may know the places uh, in the middle of the Alps. It always used to be pretty chilly. So when I was a child, um, warm days used to be rather the exception. In essence, when I was young, we used to have five days that were considered heating days. What is this? This is a day where uh, the temperature surpasses 30 degrees C. So it was rather the exception. Then there came this magic moment uh, when I was a pupil and my father brought me uh, for a short vacation in Rome. In Rome, all of a sudden, um, uh, staying there for uh, a whole week, it was like, gosh, am I in the desert? Seven days in a row above 30 degrees C. So I was very happy when I came home again. Today, last year, 2022, in that summer, on the very same place in my home, we used to have 29 days considered heating days. And for me, it was feeling as if Rome went to my home. If 2 degrees C, and that's in the meantime the very best can do scenario based on the Paris Treaty, if all technology on the planet available to decarbonize planet Earth will be deployed at maximum scale. So if 2 degrees C, which is a best case scenario in the meantime, happen, on my place, it is predicted that we're going to have 40 to 50 heating days in average. So every day I ask myself the question and people are asking me, what can I do and what can we do? In order to find an answer, it uh, takes us uh, to think about the following. Two thirds of the global CO2 emission, which is a major source of global warming, are uh, attributed to the energy sector. So it goes back to humankind burning coal, oil and gas. Second thing we need to know is that 20% of all greenhouse gases are going back to the agriculture sector. In essence, uh, the breeding and pedigree of beef. Beef uh, is the species that is burping methanol to the uh, orbit, which has a massive impact also on global heating. And here comes the good news. Knowing these two things, it starts getting clear that it is us and we can make an impact ourselves. The way we consume, manufacture, live and eat. Today is mostly about uh, technology. And uh, technology is not the only, but the very important uh, part of the solution going forward. Not only uh, technology beyond now, mostly it is technology which is here and there today. Technology such as digital technologies, artificial intelligence, 5G, electromobility, and many others that we are talking about here. Ultimately, also semiconductor technologies, which are the small little microelectronic components nobody ever sees, but we are standing behind and are the backbone for all these technologies uh, performing their miraculous uh, way of doing things for us and making, uh, making our life and our lifestyle uh, look the way it is looking. So semiconductors are uh, key enablers, key enablers for um, things that help to decarbonize planet Earth, such as renewable energies, which is wind and solar energy. Today, only 12% of the global energy production comes from renewables. 88% comes from fossils and a bit of nuclear. So having said that, 
to get the world into a net zero economy, it takes us to increase the number of renewable share towards 65%. It's a huge business case and a huge chance for mankind to get that deployed in order to stop climate warming. Second example is uh, the autonomous and uh, electric uh, driving uh, vehicles. 20% of all CO2 emission goes back to the mobility sector. Smart, intelligent and autonomously electrically driving cars help to save enormous amount of energy. Smart cars, with the help of digital technology, can communicate to each other. And just the effect of vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication already helps in a scenario in uh, megacities to reduce energy use of cars by 25%. Another uh, example is uh, smart buildings. Also here, I was astonished to read that almost 30% of global CO2 goes back to the building sector. Uh, if we make buildings smarter, for instance, through presence-based heating and cooling systems, using chips that connected to artificial intelligence, A, know when there is somebody at home or somebody in a room in an office building, and B, over observing patterns in an office building after a while, even predict when, there, when will there be people in the meeting room, stop cooling or start heating the rooms. That can help reducing uh, the energy of buildings up to 50 percentage points. So in essence, without semiconductors, no chance to stop climate change. So finally, whom and what does it take today and beyond now to get to the solution? It's obvious. It is all of us that we are today here. It is us people from corporate, from the technology sector, policy makers, people from the education sector, from media, or even simply us as private people with the way how we behave. We need to work together to team up, find new platforms and projects uh, in order to innovate and drive innovation, set ourselves ambitious targets to reach more in terms of contributing to decarbonizing planet Earth. Please take this opportunity, the DLD, as a platform to do so. Don't only drink a coffee with the neighbor. Think about other projects that you can bring forward and become part of the solution to decarbonize the world. Beyond now, Steffi, or in other words, future, is not something that just happens. Future is what we together create. I invite you to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andreas. That was really good. You will be joined now in a discussion with Anne Kavalerski from Bloomberg and my good friend David Kirkpatrick, founder of Techonomy, and now this de his devotion, devoting his life to make the climate change um, not happen. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank Along you. with Hi. all of you, Hi. I hope. Yes, thanks for having me. Steffi, thank you so much. <laughs> Steffi, is this the 18th DLD? Yes. Yeah, I thought so. Okay. so. That means I've moderated at 17 consecutive DLDs as of right now. So it's an honor to be back. It's really a wonderful event, one of the, my favorites and led by one of my favorite people. Um, what we're gonna be doing now after that great intro from Andreas, having shown how much a company you don't think about as having a lot to do with climate cares about it, Infineon, we're gonna talk about what is the role of business, big companies in particular, as we make this drastic transition to a sustainable society, a climate-friendly society uh, that, that tries to defeat global heating. So you met Andreas, who is the CMO of Infineon, and Kowalerski is the global CMO of Bloomberg Media, which is a multi-tentacled company. It's the largest tech media organization in the world by far, which is something not often understood. Um, but let me start, Anne, with asking you, we just heard one company's CMO talk about 
the urgency of this task. Do you think business in general realizes what a crisis we're in and is acting accordingly? I think they're starting to, and I'll take a step back to start with answering that question of, I'm fortunate to work for a business that absolutely is taking this seriously. Um, you know, our owner and our CEO, Mike Bloomberg, is a special envoy to the UN on climate, right? And that guides everything we do. That guides all of our innovation. So if we think about the media landscape, even just three years ago, there was no global media brand focused on sustainability. That's pretty jaw-dropping when you think about this being sort of the largest change since the industrial revolution that we are all facing. And so we launched Bloomberg Green to be that sort of global data-backed solutions-oriented media platform to cover all things climate, all things sustainability. And we're doing that because there is sort of a pull from the business community to want content around that. So what we're seeing on Bloomberg.com is if you look at sort of a C-suite business decision maker audience, they're two times more likely to be reading content around sustainability. If you also approach it more from a macro perspective, in general, since 2017, there's been a 1,500% increase in media about sustainability. So if you think about it from bottoms up and top down, there is something happening here, right? There, there's more of a groundswell and an urgency for business leaders to be more educated around sustainability, but I'd even widen that to be broader ESG, DE&I, and equality. Um, and, and there's a need to govern in that way. However, there's also a really significant lack of trust and lack of perception, particularly among a younger segmentation of, of our audience that believes they're doing enough. So I think, you know, Infineon and, and sort of what Andres just talked us through, obviously their business is doing a lot, but not all businesses are authentically doing enough in the space and even less so are talking about what they're doing in the space. Let me ask you this. If so many younger consumers in particular, younger people in society, don't believe business is doing enough, that could have some pretty negative consequences over time, right? I mean, they have to be convinced or else business actually has to do something meaningful, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's why you're seeing the, the demand among business leaders to get more enriched in the space to understand yeah. what they need to do. Um, but business needs to catch up with having enough proof points and enough actions to actually warrant kind of communications and messaging around that. Yeah, my, my thinking increasingly is we all have to basically focus on climate in our work one way or another. We don't have a choice. But Andreas, you were admirably non-Infineon in what you just said before. And we've talked a lot prepping for this session about all the things Infineon's actually doing. You said, for example, 70%, what is it, 12 billion euros, 14 billion euros in revenue. 70% of your revenues is tied to sustainability in one fashion. You have two specific areas. Just quickly tell us what those two areas are that you're doing with your chips. In essence, uh, Infineon as a semiconductor company always used to focus and put a lot of uh, R&D effort into building better products that uh, turn out to help uh, decarbonizing planet Earth. Uh, so these are products such as uh, power semiconductors. Some people call it energy saving chips microcontrollers, sensors, also connectivity devices, everything which is needed to digitalize the world, but also to uh, make renewable energy happen and to make energy efficient use of electricity a reality. And when you look into uh, what uh, is reality for us today as Infineon, then we are very proud that in the meantime, 70% of our revenue, so 10 billion plus-ish, uh, is uh, being done with uh, chips uh, that truly contribute uh, to decarbonization and decarbonize planet Earth. Uh, some people also then say, hmm, uh, but what, what are you doing with regards to your own CO2 footprint? And, and this is another particular thing I'm proud of and that pays into your direction that we put ourselves very aggressive targets uh, towards uh, CO2 neutrality until 2030. Therewith, we are already today uh, in the top 10% uh, of the sustainability index for semiconductor companies globally on the one hand side and on the other hand side, uh, the chips that we produce, they have a factor 33 times higher positive CO2 savings impact relative to the CO2 footprint that we are doing. In other words, for Infineon, decarbonization is a huge business case. Yeah. So you have both chips that control the energy use of all kinds of devices, but you also sell a lot of chips that go right into wind and solar installations. Those are big, big operations. So 
My, my wife is so, she always, she, one of the reasons I've converted to being a climate journalist is because otherwise I couldn't really stay at home with my wife. She's so upset about the climate crisis. And I agree with her, but she, one of the things she says to me all the time in, is that in everything you do, you have to emphasize, we have to go to an era of radical cooperation in all areas. And I agree with that, but it's not where we are at all. And I'd love both of you to talk about this issue of how can businesses work together as a business community to cooperate more? And also maybe since we've got very little time, how can business work with government more effectively? Any thoughts on either of those things from either one of you? Sure. So I think I think um, what I mentioned before is really interesting. Uh, there's a huge gap here between what people want business to do and see business over actually policy leaders and government being sort of the tip of the spear to affect change here and the reality of what's happening. So I think business has to close that gap um, in actuality, and obviously companies like Infineon are doing that, and also in, in sort of marketing and communications. People have to know what businesses are doing so that it's understood. And I think that's a really important point that I wanted to raise here around business in general. If we think about sustainability, messaging, regulation, even the notion, the phrase net zero, net zero does not mean the same thing depending on who's saying that those two words. And it's up to business to help educate communities about what that means and to close the education gap. And so I think the idea of media marketing communications for a business leader to talk about sustainability is massively important. The other thing that we're seeing in a lot of our research is that a brand's vision and a brand's trust is now explicitly correlated to how they're perceived in this space. So gone are the days of having reliable products and services or being seen as having you know, strong revenue. Yeah, that of course matters and contributes to those metrics as well. But increasingly, ESG and purpose-driven metrics are leading to that brand positioning and that brand strength. And so it's something that cannot be ignored anymore. Yeah, uh, yeah. talk about cooperation. Yeah, first, uh, to get to net zero, uh, it always uh, is uh, recommendable to start with the self-obligation and live it uh, yourself, live it and breathe it uh, up to uh, targets that the corporation, also me as a private person, are setting uh, myself, ourselves uh, for the CO2 footprint. But uh, with regards to cooperation, give you one simple example, uh, speaking again about renewable energy, it takes quite a lot uh, for that to come together, to bring the world from 12% energy from renewable towards 65. It takes policymakers that get us out of coal, that demand, whilst we all need energy now, in particular here in the middle of Europe when gas is running out, the opposite happens. So we start again burning coal, which is a must do to keep the economy fuel, but nevertheless on the long run, we, we, policymakers have to put means in place to get us into renewables by, by policy. Second is, um, uh, when you have renewables such as solar or wind, do we today have the grid uh, in order to distribute uh, that kind of energy which partially only comes in by day? Think about uh, solar. The answer is no. So it takes the grid providers. It takes then people who are in storage systems. Also hydrogen is a storage system. And I totally agree with my uh, uh, pre uh, the assessors who have been speaking uh, about before about hydrogen. It, it, it is a must do to store energy for the night out of solar that we collect during the day. We need to have software people and system, uh, so to say, people who bring uh, entire operating systems together in order to manage the renewable grid, if you will. That's a very simple example, and you see how wide-ranging the topic is. Yeah. Last not least, it takes you, David, Anne, and myself, and all of you, to probably then also at home on our roofs, uh, for those who have their, their own and private roofs, to install something which uh, contributes, which is a solar panel plus uh, probably then also a storage station. Yeah. You know, the, the, when I was researching for this session, the very first press release on Infineon's website is about sensors in the Amazon that are installed in cooperation with a rainforest NGO with Infineon technology where they're monitoring audio, CO2 concentrations, temperature, and other things. So for example, when the sensor detects the sound of a chainsaw, they send the, Mount, the rangers to come and tell those people to stop. That kind of thing is very cool. We're pretty much out of time, but Anne, I, I wanted, you know, you just said before, companies have to communicate better. Obviously, the truth has to be compelling, but give it, let's assume that it is. Give us an example or two of things that you are doing at Bloomberg to help companies 
message the, their commitment, which at least for some companies is genuine. Exactly. So I think greenwashing aside, we, won't go, we don't have enough time. We don't have enough time in this whole conference to talk about that. But for companies like Infineon who are doing real work, uh, we're really thinking about developing IP around this work, right? What, and what could that look like? So an example of that is, um, do you guys know the company Wholesome? It's a building manufacturer company. Um, and so they're doing things exactly what you're just talking about. If we need people to say, we want solar, we need to create demand, we need green roofing systems, cool roofing systems. And so we've worked with them to, to actually figure out what are the twi 25 most circular cities in the world. And that allows them to go into those cities and have those policy conversations with policy leaders around what they're doing. And it allows consumers to actually understand what they can do to make a difference. So you make a list or an index kind you of make thing. an index, yeah. 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 And so yeah. it becomes a, a data asset. Sponsored by the company. It becomes a point of IP that both Bloomberg and Wholesome own. Yeah. And then they can tell stories off that and bring that to life. But that's a way to actually educate. It's a way for them to gain credibility in the space and for them to talk about what they're doing in the space. There's room for so much more business creativity around this crisis. So I hope in our short conversation, we've pointed to some of the possibilities. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.